Moving forward, programming languages. The first thing that I need to review with you is, according with this, we're going to be reviewing uh, four programming languages in the next 15 weeks. And the question that you could have is, why? I mean, why reviewing four instead of maybe making you experts in one or two? Well, the reason is because we do not really care about the languages. The languages for this class are used examples, examples of paradigms, different ways to do programming. This is really what we want to review, the different approaches that we have to tell the computer what to do. And learning the languages is just what we need to do in order to know the approach. But our goal is not to be experts in the languages. So in order to review the approach, the paradigms, uh, we need to talk a little bit about history and we need to talk about what make the approaches, the paradigms different each other. So that is our topic for today. Now, let's start from the beginning. From the beginning, uh, Really, the computer do not understand any programming language, any. The only one is binary. Now, binary. Uh, what is the meaning of all of these one and zeros? How is the computer able to understand this notation? Well, what is the first thing that you do when you are reading something? Okay, so hopefully is something happening in that side. Good, okay, I will continue. Anyway, I think I am recording, yes. So if there is any issue in a period of time, the video is going to be posted later. So when you're reading a book, a book in English, what is the first thing that your brain do with the text in the book? Uh, why reading these one and zeros is looks like complicated? Well, the first thing that your brain do is to split letters and try to create groups of letters and those groups of letters create words. So the first thing that your brain is trying to do is to identify the words, right? Now, the first thing that your brain is trying to do, if I show you this program, is the same, trying to create words. Your brain is having a hard time because your brain is trying to create a word, but it's not able to find a delimiter. So your brain is thinking like, all of that is only one thing, and that creates a problem. Now, that is a problem that the humans have. That is a problem that you have. For the computer, this is okay. Now, what the computer do? What the computer do with this is the same thing that you do with English. Split in some point, create groups of letters, in this case of numbers, and the group is going to be one word. Now, the computer. At the beginning, the computer create those groups, putting together eight of these symbols, eight ones, zeros, a combination of eight digits. Do you know why eight? Eight binary numbers is equal to the byte. That is what we use for the computers. The computer, everything is about bytes. The memory, the capacity of the CPU, the hardware. Something that you're going to review regarding hardware is we put together groups of eight. 
or 16 or 32. So we put together one byte, two bytes, four bytes, and so on. Our unit is this group of eight things. Our unit is this byte. Now, what do we do with that? This is a program. And for the computer, every group of eight is one word, one thing. The only thing that the computer do is putting together these eight and figuring out what is this, what is this, and so on. And that make a program. Now, obviously, uh, if I ask you to read this, it's kind of complicated. I mean, just counting eight and figuring out what it's going to be and do the same several times, uh, it's not the best way to do programming. So, this is the only thing that the computer understands, but obviously, we do not want to do this. So, someone have this idea. This idea of moving from that to something else. Something else that we're going to call assembly language. This is an idea from the 50s, more or less. Someone had the idea that, well, you know what? Instead of writing zeros and ones, let's use something like find and replace, literally. And I am going to create a program and that program is going to use some kind of words. Each of these words can be found in a document and then replaced with the equivalent of that as binary. For instance, the push. Maybe push is going to be this. Every time that you found push in a document, in a program, in assembly, the computer can replace that push for one. The only thing that I need to do is to give the computer this table and the table is going to have the word and the equivalent in binary. So I can create my programs like this and then using that table of equivalences, the computer can do this find and replace and transform this instruction in this number. Now, something that I can do, something that happened in the low level of the computer is each instruction have two parameters, always. If you notice what I am giving you here, instruction, parameter one, parameter two. And if you do not need two parameters, you can leave empty the space. And if the space is empty, basically is eight zeros. And each of these words also have an equivalence from the word to binary. Uh, maybe it's the address of something, a registry, a place in the memory, whatever. But that word, that name for a place like the registry EVP, uh, well, it have a number and maybe that is the number. At the end, I can do something like this as a human and use with search and replace, I can transform that to binary code. And obviously I can eliminate the enters, all the enters at the end of these lines is something I can use delete and therefore, this program can become something like this. Use zeros and ones. That was the first approach to a compiler. And the name for that is not yet a compiler. The name for that is an assembler. And because the name for that, this find and replace and translating like this, is done by an assembler, uh, someone have the idea of calling this language, 
this idea of the three columns and the word that can be replaced for something in binary, assembly language. And again, I am talking about the 50s. It is clear the difference between machine learning and assembly language. Yes, no, maybe. Maybe. Yes, okay. So, let me give you an example. Two plus three, x equal two plus three, semicolon. That is something that you know can be aligned in Java, yes or no? This is what we call a high level language instruction. That is an instruction in a high level language. That is an instruction that we humans understood, right? Now, what is the equivalence of that in assembly language? In assembly language, that instruction is something like the following. Four lines. Yes. Uh, higher the level of the language, short the sentence. Higher the abstraction, lower the level, more elements that we need to provide because the computer is not smart. Uh, let me tell you what is happening in assembly. In assembly, I am asking the computer to move that is one instruction for the CPU. Move. Move what? The number two. Where? To some place called it AX. It's a box inside of your computer. Put the two in this place that we are going to call AX. Uh, it's a registry, you're going to learn about it. Second instruction, if you notice, it's almost the same. Move a number three to the same place, the AX. I am asking the computer, put in this place a number two, and also put in the same place a number three. Instructions for the hardware. Then, OPR, OPR, operation. I am asking the computer, computer, you're going to do an operation. And here, I put this number two. Uh, yes, the computer have a lot of operations. The operation zero, one, two, three, four, five, as many operations as the computer support, the operations are not plus, minus, multiplication. That do not exist. Those symbols are high level language. The computer do not have that. The computer have numbers. And let me tell you that the operation number two is addition. What happened with the operation zero and one? That is a different story. The operation zero is going to be the end of a program. The operation one usually is return in a method. The operation two, addition. I am asking the computer to do the operation too. Uh, but in order to do the operation too, I need numbers. Well, operation two with whatever you have in AX. By the way, before I put the two and the three in AX, this place. So I am asking, do an addition with whatever you have there. What is going to happen is the computer is going to do the addition of two and three. And finally, I am asking the computer another instruction. Store, STO, store, store what? Uh, whatever you have in AX. By the way, usually the computer, if I ask the computer to take something from a box and do some operation, the computer is going to put back the result in the same place. That is the way that the computer works. The computer is going to take the two, it's going to take the three, it's going to do the addition, and it's going to put the five in the same place. So when I ask the computer to store 
in X. And let me be clear, I am using X just because I put X here. But X is a variable and variables are a place in the memory, remember? And every single place in the memory have an address. We're going to talk about that. And addresses are numbers. So really this X is another number, the address of that variable. The only thing that I am asking the computer is to, to store whatever is in a X in the variable X. High level language assembly, kind of uh, bytecode in Java. And then you can translate that to binary. Binary, yeah, this search and replace that I mentioned before, because move, move is going to be something like 001, again, another move, 001, OPR is going to be something like this operation, and STO maybe is going to be this one. Again, it's like a table in which you have the name and you have a number. Which number? Depending on your CPU, depending on your computer. Each computer is going to have a particular number for a particular instruction. So here I am just making up the numbers. Now, the two, the three, the two, and the X, oh, they are going to be binary numbers. You can put the two in binary. The two in binary is something like this. And then the three in binary is something like this. And then I have again the two is something like this. Notice this two is a value and this two is the number of an operation. It doesn't matter because it's a parameter for the particular instruction that you have before. And the X, well, you need the address for X. What is the address of X? I don't know, but something like that. It's going to be, again, a binary number. And IX, IX is a place in the computer. All the places in the computer have an address, a number. So something like this, and basically it's exactly the same in all the places. And that is the equivalent in binary of only one line in Java. Did you notice one line in Java, four lines in assembly, and a lot of zeros and ones? Makes sense, clear. Questions? Makes sense. Good, okay, so going back. We do not want to program in binary. I mean, right now I show you from Java to assembly to binary, uh, you are happy programming in Java, hopefully. Uh, you do not want to do your programs starting directly with binary. I mean, right now, hopefully you understand what is happening here, what is the meaning of this, but just imagine programming with this, the facility for making mistakes. I mean, oops, this one was a one. Very hard to find. And uh, this one is not so bad, but your programs could be very, very big. Uh, some of you are going to be working with some kind of assembly language in another class. So I am not going to talk a lot about this, but just think about it. It's one step above moving forward to high level, 90-50. Okay, so moving forward from assembly, the people start asking for high level languages. High level languages, as in my example, x equal two plus three, something like that. Something that is easy for the humans, right? Well, the people start working and in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, I'm talking 20th century, uh, a lot of programming languages were created. There are a lot of languages, a lot. Some of them, uh, you are still using them. For instance, uh, one of the languages that we're going to review is C. Uh, any idea in which year uh, they create C? Guessing? In 1990? 70, C. We're going to learn a programming language that was created in the 70s? Yes. And most of the software that you have in your computer well, is going to be C++, but still the drivers that you have are in this language. Sorry, guys, there is nothing new. Uh, 
C++, as I mentioned, the other language that we're going to review. 80s, 82, 83. Java, you learned Java in CS 110. Uh, in which year Java was born? Do you remember? Do you know? 90s, yes. 92. What about Prolog and Lisp? I am going to put 60s, 70s, depending on the flavor that you're using, but they are before C. That is what we're reviewing. More or less the history of the languages that we're going to be checking and this, this, and this are the languages that we use today. And a lot of things from Lisp now are in Java 9, the functional programming part that we're going to review later. So what happened? Well, machine language, 40s, uh, as I mentioned before, 47, uh, I mentioned 50, but 47, assembly. The example that I showed you. Question for your exam, can I ask you what is an assembler? And the answer is going to be assembler. Is a program? Yes, it's a program what that program do translate translate what assembly language to machine language makes sense assembler translate assembly language something like this or what i showed you before to machine language translate as I mentioned before, search and replace. Uh, you can be thinking right now, a compiler also do translation. What is the difference between the assembler and the compiler? Isn't a compiler, so an assembler, it's a direct replacement, right? So you're going straight from a, a command to the binary equivalent for that. Yes. Whereas with the compiler, there has to be some actual, um, some logic in there figuring out what that comes out to as different commands. It's not yes. a direct translation. Yes. Let me be clear with this for everyone. An assembler is going to translate assembly language to machine language. The translation is going to be, as I mentioned before, search and replace, a direct translation search something and I replace for something else. A compiler is something a little bit more complex and it's more complex because the compiler is going to translate from high level language down, down to assembly or down directly to machine language. Two options, both could be possible. In general, a compiler is going to translate from high level to low level. Low level, assembly or machine, low level. The big difference is when you use a compiler, you are not doing a search and replace. A compiler is something more complex than that. Think about it with my previous example. This was replaced by this, and this was replaced by this. If you work here, it's a direct replacement. But what about from this to this? There is a direct replacement? I mean, if there is a direct replacement, which was the key value of the plus? Well, really the plus was all this line here. It's not what you like direct thing. It's not what you like search and replace. It's something more complex. 
think about using uh, the translator for one human language to another. A compiler need to review not only words and use copy paste equivalent, but a compiler need to understand the grammar of the language. Makes sense. And some things like this is more plus is going to be translated to a full line and other things are going to be translated use a small thing depending on the grammar, depending on the rules. So assembler, compiler, mm, high level languages. The first one is from the 1952. 1952, the first programming language that is considered high level. Uh, which one? Maybe you noticed that I put a box with that name. Anyway, use history. Do you know what are the features that make a language, any language, talking about programming, be considered high level? The minimum thing that a language needs to have in order to be considered high level. The reason because machine and assembly are not high level. Basically, three things. Three elements that if you have those three elements in a language, any language, that language is high level, is close to the humans. These three things. And those three things are going to be in all the languages that we're going to be reviewing. Any language that has these three things is high level. Three things. Number one, every single high level language allow you to work with variables. Variables, yes, allow you to use names instead of addresses. Address numbers. Let me be clear. Any variable is a place in your memory and your memory is a lot of boxes, bytes, and each of those boxes have an address. And I am going to represent those address using hexadecimal numbers. A high level programming language allows you to call this box X instead of using this hexadecimal number to access. That is the feature number one of a high level programming language, clear. A variable is a place in the memory. Every single place in the memory have an address. The address is a number. The first thing that a high level programming language is going to allow you to do is to use names instead of the address in order to access that place. And that is going to be connected with the idea of variable declaration later. We're going to talk about it, but names for the variables. Second, every single high level programming language is going to allow you to make procedures, functions, or you know this in Java as methods. Uh, let me be clear, any high level programming language is going to allow you to split your program in different models in different paragraphs. Think about this. Instead of having a program and all the program be like one big list of instructions, a high level programming language is going to allow you to create methods, functions, procedures. They are the same, but in different languages, they receive different names. Think about them like the paragraphs in a paper. A high level programming language allow you to create paragraphs and obviously call them and connect them and passing parameters and all those stuff. Creating methods, functions, or procedures, whatever name you give to them, these blocks in your programs is something that any programming language high level is going to allow you to do. Good? 
And the last one, any high level programming language allow you to use control structures. Help me, what I am talking about, which are the control structures in Java? Control structures. Yes. You review five or six. If, for, when, etc. <laughs> when what? Again? If, for, when, all that sort of stuff. Yes, those things. Uh, control structures used to make a review in Java. There are two types of control structures in any high level programming language. Number one, conditions. Number two, loops. Uh, that looks like something that you review with Java. Conditions. Uh, in Java in particular, Java gives you for conditions, if else, switch, and the question mark operator. I'm not sure if you review the question mark operator, but at least you review if, else, and switch. Loops. Java give you while, do while, and for. At least you work with those. Any high level programming language is going to give you loops and conditions. Maybe not exactly the same that you have with Java, but at least something equivalent. Any high level programming language have those. So, variables methods, functions, or procedures, different names for the same, and control structures, conditions, and loops. Those three are the characteristics of a high-level programming language. Every single one, Fortran, Cobol, Lisp, C, C++, Java, they are going to have something that do this. Maybe not the same in all of them, but something that is the equivalent to Loops, conditions, procedures, functional methods, and variables. Make sense? Good? Obviously, assembly language is not high level. Assembly language do not give you all of this. They work in a different way. Machine language do not give you all of this. Not in the same way that you have it in a high level, but remember, at the end, if you have a program in high level, somehow that program can be translated here and here. So somehow your variables, your methods, and your control structures can be translated to a representation in assembly and or a representation in binary. But if you have this, you are using a high level programming language. Now, that is good. Um, how many programming languages do we have? Well, let me tell you this. When the people start doing programming languages, when someone figure out how to create a compiler, several different people in several different parts of the world start creating their own languages. Uh, in fact, this is something that you're going to do in 340. The next class, you're going to be able to create your own language a small, easy one. But creating a new language is something easy, uh, that structure. Creating a program that translates from one language to another is not complex. Uh, it's a good practice for programmers. So you're going to do that in 340. But here, for some people, they decide that they are going to create languages and those languages are going to have, remember, variables, methods, and control structures. And some people think about this. Uh, if you read what I have there, looks like Java. It's something that you can understand. You can remember, oh, okay, x equals something, do while, another variable int. Some people develop languages similar to this. A different group of people. I don't like the plus. I prefer to use Zoom as a name. Oh, okay. I would like to end the lines with the semicolon. I do not like the semicolon. I prefer to put things inside of parentheses. You create your language. You can use the symbols that you want. You can use the operators 
as a symbol or the operators as a word. Ah, uh, you can use do while, or maybe you like the most repeat. Both are loops. It's your choice. You are the creator of the language. Moreover, there are people that prefer the arrow instead of the equal. Uh, the dot at the end instead of the semicolon, because the dot is what we use in English. Uh, well, what about the for loop? But you know what? I do not like the parentheses. This four and parentheses, no, I just want four and maybe the number. Well, instead of the semicolons in the for loop, what about using two? And I have four, one, two, ten. It's easy to read. Well, for some people. And we have another group of people that is like, can we just do something like this? I mean, more natural, like human language, like what is the result of two plus three? And notice that I put two and three like words, not like numbers. And just like that, and at the end, a uh, quotation mark, because it's something that I want you computer to ask me. A program, a program, a program, and a program. Different people. Anyone can create a language. Anyone can put a proposal on the table. Make sense? Now, what happened? You can search how many programming languages exist, and there are a lot, a lot. Now, use as any other thing. Some programming languages become popular, and others use die. No one uses them. Things happen in that way. Okay, so if we look all the different options that exist in terms of programming languages, we can create these like small groups. So instead of talking about all the different languages, we can talk about, okay, this group of languages are kind of similar, not the same, but they follow kind of the same ideas. This group follow similar ideas. This group follows similar ideas. Uh, think about it. If we talk about human languages, maybe I can mention uh, Portuguese. Maybe I can mention Spanish. And one way or another, uh, at the end, we're going to put Portuguese and Spanish in the same group because they share some ideas, because they are kind of similar, not the same. Just similar. But if I mention Chinese and I mention English, uh, probably you're going to put English and Chinese in different groups just because uh, they do not exactly share the same uh, format. Let's start with the idea of different symbols. So they correspond to different groups. These groups receive the name of paradigms, programming paradigms, paradigms, different ways to do programming. And each programming language correspond or follow a particular paradigm. If you review the dictionary, what is the definition of paradigm? And hopefully you could agree with me in these three key ideas. I mean, you can go right now and review the dictionary, or maybe you already know the definition, but hopefully you agree, paradigm. A way of thinking, a way to do something. In this case, there's something is programming. One way to do programming, one approach to create programs, one approach to give instruction to the computer. And that one particular approach is accepted by a group of people. 
I mean, you cannot have a paradigm in which you are the only member. So you cannot create a new programming language and also create a new paradigm alone. So different ways of the programming. These groups that I mentioned before. A group of people, all of them with a similar idea about the meaning of programming. Even though they can create different languages, but they share ideas, they share a way of thinking. This is what we're going to review in this class, the different paradigms of programming, the different ways, the different approaches for give the computer instructions. And obviously you are thinking like, okay, which are those approaches? Which are those paradigms that we're going to be reviewing here? Well, approach number one, the one that you already know, object-oriented programming. There is a group of people that do programming following this idea that everything is an object. And the paradigm is object-oriented programming. Now, for these people, can you mention one example of a language that follow the paradigm of object-oriented programming? And hopefully everyone says yes, Java, good. And if you remember, I mentioned this, C++ is going to be another language that also follow the object-oriented paradigm. So two languages for the object-oriented approach. Obviously, the paradigm is object-oriented programming. And we are going to name the languages object-oriented languages. Java is an object-oriented language to do object-oriented programming. And the same for C++. Now, the other approach that we're going to review is structural programming. And here, the problem is that some people call it structural or procedural or imperative. And I am giving you all the names because depending on the textbook and depending on the web page that you're reviewing, uh, you're going to find those names. Uh, they are the same. It's the same paradigm, use different names, different moments in the history, different people, but structural, procedural, or imperative, that is another way to do programming. The other one that we're going to review here, functional, and the other one that we're going to review here, logic programming. Those are the only ones? No, there are more. And I put this column here. There are more paradigms, but those are the four that we're going to be reviewing here. Only four. Logic, functional, structural, and object-oriented. Uh, for object-oriented, C++ and Java, for a structural, which one is the structural one? C. Uh, the functional one. And the logic one. Right? So, just to give you an idea about the time and about how many programming languages exist in each category. Uh, the first programming language that someone create in the functional paradigm is this column here. And more or less in the 60s, 50s is Lisp. And it's the same Lisp that we're going to be reviewing. And as you can notice going down, uh, there is not a lot of things that change. There are some flavors of Lisp. In fact, in the textbook, if you review, uh, the textbook describe a language, small talk, that is basically a flavor of Lisp, an evolution of Lisp, a child of Lisp, if you want. But the example that I'm going to be showing you is Lisp, use the original one, but they work with the interpreter of Smalltalk. Uh, for Prolog, if you notice, early 70s and is the only one no child no family they are kind of alone we're going to talk about why 
most of the evolution of programming happened in the imperative paradigm. As I mentioned before, the first one Fortran, and you can notice there are a lot of languages there. I mean, I do not put everything, but I just give you an idea of the first programming languages, Cobol, Algo, and Fortran, and then go down, you will notice the one that we're going to review here, C, just because it's the one that we are still using, and 70s. You are going to notice that this one is connected with C++. By the way, you are going to notice that C++ is here, kind of in the middle of object-oriented and also structural. We're going to talk about why, but it's true. That language belongs to both paradigms, can be used as a procedural or can be used as an object-oriented. Really? Yes, really? We're going to talk about it. And it's not here, but if we continue this line down, Java could be around here because Java is kind of a grandchild of C and is kind of a, a child of C++. I mean, have kind of some influence for that. It belongs to that line of the family. So Java, C, C++, Prolog, and Lisp. And that is more or less what we're going to be reviewing. Four paradigms, five programming languages. The only thing that we need to do is to review which are the features of each of those languages and the features of each of those paradigms. Quickly, the paradigms. And I need to talk about what is the difference between each of those four paradigms. Let's start with the imperative paradigm. What makes a programming language be imperative or procedural or structural, whatever? Well, Key ideas. If you notice, the imperative paradigm is the first one that you have. It's the first approach. It's the first paradigm that someone follows. So to make this clear, a procedural or a structural or imperative language is going to have the following features. Number one, any language that follows this paradigm is going to be able to allow you to divide your program in functions, procedures, models, subroutines, or methods. Whatever name you want to use. Any programming language in this category is going to allow you to have variables. Any programming language in this category is going to give you conditional and loops. You already mentioned those three things in a high level programming languages. Any programming language that give you these basic things plus one more data structures and data structures. I am talking from the beginning arrays variables, any way to handle data. If you have a language and that language give you this, you have a procedural, structural, or imperative programming language. Uh, what I am telling you is any high level language by default can be imperative or procedural unless we can move him to a different category. The simple programming languages, the beginning of the programming language, how the people start programming with this is the imperative procedural model. Is the simple one, is the easy one. Makes sense. The beginning, three things, four things, and you have the simple programming language that you can have. Remember, we're going to start with this one, 70s. It's going to be very, very easy. Ah, quotation marks. Imperative paradigm. Tricky ideas. Okay, that was easy. What about the others? Tell me, if we talk about object-oriented, what do you have in an object-oriented programming language that I do not mention here for the structural programming languages? What do you have in Java that I do not mention in the structural paradigm? 
I think it's pretty clear what I am not mentioning. You have classes, right? Something that you have in the object-oriented paradigm that you do not have in the structure is the possibility of create classes. And when you create classes, the next thing that you have is the possibility of having things public, private, and protected. Hopefully you remember those keywords. Uh, what is the goal of those keywords in Java? What can you do with public, private, and protected? Where did you use public, private, and protected? The class can be public, private, and protected, yes. For security reasons, yes. What else? The methods can be public, private, and protected, yes. And the variables, good. So the actions, methods, the data, the variables, and the class itself can be public, private, and protected, and is connected with this idea of security. We're going to talk more about it. Next, if you have classes, one important thing that you can do with classes is inheritance. And something that we're going to review is that when you can do inheritance, you can do polymorphism. Don't worry if you are not familiar with the concept of polymorphism, we're going to review it, but I hope that you are familiar with the concept of inheritance. Inheritance, one class can be the father of another class. One class can be a child from another class. You can connect to classes with this idea of creating a family. That is something that the object-oriented paradigm gives you. Think about it. You start with the structure, you start here, and someone have this idea of the classes and the inheritance and la la la, and suddenly you are here. All the characteristics of a imperative language, a structural language, are also inside of an object-oriented language. So, Conditions and loops, data structures, global variables, models, functions, and whatever. And all of this plus this, that is what you have in an object-oriented programming language. All the previous one plus this one, and that make the object-oriented paradigm. Object-oriented, structural. Hopefully the difference is clear. The difference is all of this, everything related with classes, inheritance, and the protection of access. Good? So think about it. When we review C, I am going to ask you to forget about classes. But still, you are going to need loops, conditions, and variables. It's going to be fine. Now, those two, as you can notice, are highly connected. What about the others? the others. Functional paradigm, and I am talking about Lisp. Key idea in Lisp. Lisp and the people that create Lisp, the people that is involved in the functional language, they want to do programming simpler. They want things to be easy to do. Well, quotation marks. They want programming to be more similar to mathematical functions. They want more math in programming, more programming like algebra or calculus, more like writing equations, not exactly using English plus uh, numbers and a crazy combination of symbols and keywords. What are you talking about? Tell me, which is the big difference between your classes, uh, your 110 class with Java? What is the big difference between writing something in Java and writing something in algebra? What is the big difference between 
something like this in math and something like this in Java. Do you remember? Rules. Think about this line alone. What is missing there in order to make this work in Java? Exactly. The first thing that you learn in Java, and you use like one or two months talking about it, is data types. When you do programming, at least in the structural model and in the object-oriented model, something that you need to learn is every single variable have a type. And for some people, data types, uh, types do not match, is something that make programming not easy. The first thing that you are going to notice in the functional paradigm is we do not have data types. There is no data types. The first thing that you're going to notice in the functional paradigm is I can do x equal five in one line, and in the next line, the same x is going to be hello. Because think about math, x is a variable, and the variable can store the five, and then the variable can store a string. I don't care about the data types. I am storing information. The number, the string, they are information. That is what I want to do. the semantic, the meaning. I want the computer to understand me. I do not want to deal with the details and the data types for these people. The functional paradigm is use details because they are used to the mathematical representation. In the mathematical representation, you don't care about this X being integer float or whatever. It's use a variable and the variable store whatever. JavaScript is a crazy combination of different things. Uh, we're going to talk about it when we finish with the object-oriented and the structural because JavaScript is crazy. Uh, it's object-based, but you still can program with a structural way. And some of the functional things are now in Java 9, but also in JavaScript. I mean, right now the functional qualities, lambda calculus, if you are familiar with that thing. If not, we're going to review it, but the functional is kind of getting inside of several different languages. We need to talk about that later. So if I show you a program in Lisp, for instance, This is the least version of this Java method. I am not expecting you to understand everything that is happening here, but can you notice some differences? Uh, int, 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 data types, data types for the parameter, remember? Data types for the return, no data types. The method is get max value. You can think about that like a method. In Java, that method is public and is static. You remember those keywords and return an integer and that method receive an array of integers. Do you remember the square brackets? In Lisp, the only thing that I do is I have a method, get max value. Uh, usually in Java, you put this uppercase letter to connect two words together. So get max value, the M and the B uppercase, use because that is kind of the idea. With Lisp, instead of that, everything is lowercase and you, we usually use the minus to connect the words, uh, use different ways to write. But the important thing is, it's also a method and the method receive something the name is list and I do not have there a data type and I do not have their square brackets to indicate that this an array is used. I receive something, that's it. And I do not need to tell what I am going to return. I do not need to tell that I am going to return an integer, even though I am going to return an integer below. Uh, another difference you can notice, uh, 
curly bracket, semicolon, uh, a lot of symbols. The only thing that the people use here is for every single thing, parentheses, anything. You want to put things together, parentheses. You want to create a method, this is the open parentheses for creating the method. This is the closing parenthesis for ending the method. Uh, you want to do a do, this is the open parenthesis for the do, and the do is going to finish uh, in some place here because everything is inside of a do, inside of a loop. This is the parenthesis that close the loop. So parentheses are going to tell you what is inside of what. For some people, that is easy. For other people, that is like crazy, a lot of parentheses. It uses a different paradigm. Make sense? And yes, we need to review that everything is a list, list like a linked list, yes. We're going to talk about it. And you notice also the operators. The operators are at the beginning, not in the middle. That is going to be a different thing because for some people in the mathematical field, the operators at the beginning is a notation that they use. So again, a different paradigm. Advantages and disadvantages, we're going to talk about it, but functional programming. Finally, for the logic part, um, Prolog. The key idea for Prolog, I mean, the key idea here was, I want the semantic to be simple. Simple mean I do not want data types and I want to follow more like a mathematical approach. Uh, here, it's going to become more explicit. For the logic programming paradigm, the key idea, I do not want to program. I want to use a computer. I want to work with the computer. I want to get information from the computer. I want the computer to process data. I do not want to do programming. And that means variables. I don't care about variables. Uh, loops. Conditions, I do not care about loops and conditions. Uh, methods, I mean, this idea of split the program in several paragraphs, I don't care about that. I do not want to do that. Uh, then, well, this is an example of a program in Prolog. Uh, and you can notice, I mean, this is the program. This line here is part of the program. This line here is part of the program. This line here is part of the program. Uh, the percentage is the equivalent of this in Java, a comment. So every time that I have a percentage at the beginning of a line, all of this, they are comments. Comments with percentage. Yes, every people can define in the language whatever they want to use. We're going to have programs that use the chart for the comments. We have programs that use slash slash as a comment, and this one is going to use the percentage for comments. Uh, you can notice what I have here. Uh, Prolog is artificial intelligence idea. What is the idea? I give information to the computer. Uh, that information is facts. We're going to review that, but basically it's telling the computer something about something like, student, uh, John, um, CSC240. I'm going to tell you more about this, but this is kind of a statement. This is kind of a fact. I am telling the computer, you know what, computer? Uh, I have students, one student have this name, and in particular is taking this class. Information. All of this, males and females, information. Like filling a form with data. After you have the data, you can ask the computer, something like who is the parent of Charles. I am asking for information. Uh, I can ask the computer if this is true or false. In the comment I am giving you kind of the statement in English that is the meaning for the particular line in Prolog. 
And as you can notice, basically what's happened with this language, the goal of this language is I put information in the computer, like in a database, and my programs, quotation marks, is I can ask the computer about correlationships between the information that I give to the computer. I can put in the computer all your data, your names, your grades, and so on. And then I can ask, computer, can you tell me the names of the students that get an A plus in this class? Period. It's not about doing a for loop and an if and grade greater than something. No. It's about this is the information, computer, this is my question. I do not want to do the program. I do not want to do the loops, the condition, and la, la, la. Just tell me the answer. And yes, you're thinking about something like AI. This is the beginning of that idea. Remember, this is for the 70s. The first approach to do something like programming, but more about processing data. I give you data, you give me answer to my questions. We're going to review the language, we're going to play with this and different examples. That's it. Logic, no programming at all. Functional programming, among other things, without data types and more in this mathematical model. Fun uh, object oriented, the one that you already know, but we're going to review another language. And the imperative or structural that is basically what you already know from Java, but we're going to remove the classes and therefore everything that is connected with classes. Those are the four paradigms that we're going to be reviewing and those are the four new languages that we're going to be learning. Any questions so far? It is clear. For your exam, can you answer the question, hey, give me three features, three characteristics of imperative programming. Hey, give me three features, three characteristics of object-oriented programming. Hey, tell me, what is the most important feature of functional programming? Hey, tell me, what is the most important feature of logic programming? You can expect those questions in your exam. Moreover, a list of features and select all the features that apply to structural programming. You have a list, could be all of the ones that I mentioned today, and you need to select which apply to a particular paradigm that I mentioned in the question. That is going to be part of the theoretical questions for your midterm. Good? Are we fine? Any question before we finish today? Will the key ideas be important as well as the features? The slide with features, yes. Uh, well, I'm going to, this should be uh, on Canvas right now, but again, uh, imperative is basically variables, loops and conditions, the capacity of create methods, functions, or procedures, whatever is the name, and data structures. Those are the features for imperative procedural paradigm. Uh, Object-oriented, the main feature, classes, and therefore the ability to use public, private, and protected, and inheritance. Inheritance is connected with polymorphism. Maybe you do not remember right now or you do not know right now polymorphism, but you know inheritance. So three for object oriented. Uh, for functional, the main one is a simpler semantic that have a lot of meanings, but right now the example that I can give you, the one that you know is no data types. And no data types make the semantic very, very simple. And the mathematical model. Uh, I show you the idea of using parentheses. I show you the idea of using the operators at the beginning. That is a very uh, mathematical uh, thing. In general, the abstraction level is higher than in object-oriented or in structural. And finally, for the functional paradigm, the main feature is what I can describe like, we do not want to do programming no variables, or not in the way that we have it in Java or C++ or C, uh, no loops, no conditions, and no methods or functions. Those three key things here, we do not have them. We do not have them explicitly, but inside of the computer, somehow they exist. But you as a programmers, you do not need to create them. And again, it's something that we're going to review, but in general, for the functional, we do not want to do programming, not as you know programming. 
not with those three elements. And that are the features. Good? Okay, so guys, use some time. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, see you next lecture. Thank you.